This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, welcome to Trump Week on Think Tech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called Hate in America. Why are we going to talk about it? Um, why can't we all be friends? Uh, it's, it's time we take a hard look at ourselves and find a way to come together for the benefit of all of us. And to do that, we have to appreciate the history. And we have Professor uh, John Davidan, who's a history professor at HPU, to help us understand what, what has happened in this country uh, and what the history is, and so we can appreciate um, you know, the context for Donald Trump's remarks, his varying remarks, right. his remarks here and there and hither and right. yon over the past few days, including today, right. where he said he felt liberated yeah. by his um, you know, open expression of what was in his heart a couple of days ago yeah. in the lobby of Trump Tower, uh, doubling down on his previous position, right. which did suggest to a lot of people in this country, a majority of the people in this country, uh, that he favored, relatively speaking, he favored white supremacy. And indeed, uh, that Symp comment, sympathetic to sympathetic, sympathetic to, to, white, to white, white supremacy. supremacy. Yeah. And indeed, you know, that that comment and the comments he's made has somehow engendered, um, you know, a public uproar, but also a coming together of the, uh, of, the of the white supremacist group in right. this country. Right. Uh, you know, and I, there's a whole study about how, as president, you can foment unrest with just a few words. Yeah. And he's, right. he's done that. He's been doing it for six months now. Yeah. Yes, he has. <laughs> so, John David, Ed, thank you for coming. Sure. Here. This is an important show. Yes. Uh, we need to put it in context to understand, you know, all the historical events in this country that have led to the special situation we're at now, where people are proud to be white supremacists. They say a lot more is coming, that they're getting together yeah. and, they're, and they're yeah. relying on the Second Amendment to have guns, and uh, they march in formation with military helmets and weapons. Right. Uh, and there was a piece over the over the weekend about a, a Jewish temple that was in Charlottesville. They were terrified because some of those guys mm. were out in front with yeah. AK-47s yeah. during yeah. their weekend service. Yeah. So what we have, and you know, the question they put, and I put it to you, is, wait a minute, is this the United States or somewhere else? What is going on? Yeah. It's hard to believe what's yeah. going on. Right. Well, it's it, first of all, it's shocking. It's, it's pretty horrible stuff. And unfortunately, I do think the rhetoric of the president has empowered this group. We've talked about this before. But, uh, you know, he's not, he, he tried to, right? He tried to condemn them. And then the next day he said, no, nah, I don't think so. So uh, he clearly has some sympathy for, for white supremacists. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's terribly embarrassing to the Republican Party. It's embarrassing to the great majority of Americans in the country. I think 25% said what he said was sort of was good enough. 75% said, no, no, this is terrible. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it, this is, uh, it's very disturbing stuff, but it has a very deep history within our country. And that's what we want to study today, yeah. that deep history that has been revealed and we are reminded of it by virtue right. of these events over right. the past few right. days. Yeah. So let's talk about the history. Okay. Where did this all begin, this white supremacy yeah. thing? Right. So, so, so then, yeah, I mean, that's the right question is, how can it be that in 2017 you have white supremacists in the United States who are proclaiming their superiority to other races? How, how is this possible? Well, there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a history to this which is quite important. And, and in order for us to understand this, we have to go back to the Civil War okay. uh, and Reconstruction. So the Civil War uh, was, of course, a battle about slavery. It was actually a battle about a particular race and the oppression of that race. And coming out of the Civil War, you have the country embracing new freedom. Lincoln embraced new freedom. And then the entire country did through the Civil Rights Amendments, through the uh, the, the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendments, uh, freeing slaves, establishing a new civil rights basis for all citizens in the country, and then uh, allowing, banning discrimination for uh, the 15th Amendment, banning discrimination on voting except for criminals. Uh, and so we thought, okay, that lays the basis for the country going forward, not so fast. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is where uh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a kind of counterforce to this, what I would call an emancipationist version of Reconstruction. 
I, I hear in between your remarks, the essence of it is that maybe the North did not do Reconstruction properly. Maybe no. they were maybe they were pushing well, too much. No, I, I, I well, um, that's some white supremacists actually would argue that what the North did was a, a military dictatorship in the South, which imposed these Reconstruction amendments upon the South, and then. Now, now we're getting into actually this. Other, so you have the emancipationist narrative, and then you have the white supremacist narrative, and these even two, way back then. Yeah, absolutely, and this is right this after is, 1865. This, this is during Reconstruction, and these two narratives are competing for space in the country. Uh, and the white supremacist narrative argues, you know, what happened in the in the Civil War was just a big mistake, a war between brothers. And then in Reconstruction, you have a dictatorship of the South a union between uh, the Republican Party and African Americans, a big mistake allowing African Americans voting rights and the right to serve in office. And then the Ku Klux Klan comes in and it saves the day. This is a simplified version of, of a narrative which actually as it develops from the 18, late 1870s onward, it actually becomes the dominant interpretation of the Civil War and Reconstruction. The Civil War was a mistake, and so you have these, through the years, you have these union, reunions of northern and southern soldiers and uh, expressions of the tragedy of the Civil War, and then you have this narrative about African Americans, that they should not have equal rights, that they are inferior. And uh, this, this carries through the 20th century. It's only in the 1950s that you, begin to, that you have historians who begin to embrace a different narrative, a narrative of Reconstruction as a positive, uh, as a what, positive what, move. What you're saying, I think, is that, you know, that the war ended, the North won, but the war wasn't really over. That's right. And they were still right. fighting it uh, decades right. and decades yes. later, and yes. that fight included the Ku Klux Klan. That's right. So, but also, so you we, use the word dictatorship yes. of the North. So if we can just hang on a second, can you bring up the first slide? Yes. And this is, of course, the Ku Klux Klan, uh -huh. which today comprises about 180 open members and probably another 3,000 total. Throughout what states? Well, it's mostly in the South now. Mm -hmm. There's a, there might be a couple of members in the uh, uh, in Indiana, uh, Southern Indiana, Ohio, that that area. But it's really mostly in the South. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but the, there was there were times when the Ku Klux Klan was really out of business, where it faded off the scene. Can That's you correct. Talk That's about correct. the continuum right. there. Right. So, so the Ku Klux Klan, which in this this. A white supremacist version of Reconstruction is actually the liberating force of, of the South. The Ku Klux Klan first starts in uh, the late 1860s. It actually starts as a veterans organization for Confederate, for the Civil War. For, yeah. for Confederate soldiers. Yeah. That's right. And, and so then it develops in the early 1870s as a force to try to intimidate these new voters, African Americans, away from the polling place. And it also causes some violence. There are there are some uh, the, there's some assassinations of African Americans who are attempting to vote, and so on. But you um, said before that it was a dictatorship of the North and the South. Well, it's uh, it's it's the, the situation in the South is complicated. I would see it. I think again that's the white supremacist interpretation. Of course. But what what but, what are but, they referring to? But what they're referring to is uh, uh, the the Republican Party, the Republican Congress actually passes a a very strong Reconstruction with these uh, Reconstruction Amendments and then sends Northern troops back down into the South. It revokes an earlier Reconstruction by President Andrew Johnson who took power after Lincoln was assassinated. Johnson was a Southerner. It turns that back and then implements this new Reconstruction. A higher level of enforcement well, with, using yes, the military. With, with, American, with, with Union soldiers in the South then enforcing these new Reconstruction uh, watching over the the uh, the reabsorption of these states into the union because the states now have to pass these reconstruction amendments and then and then uh, trying to protect those civil rights that have just been given to uh, to African Americans. So, so it kind of was a war of sorts. Well, you had it, the military yeah. from the north yeah. uh, imposing these the new amendments and the Ku Klux Klan is responding to that. Yeah. But I mean, you know, my my question though is, uh, I wonder, would it have been possible for the north 
uh, to do a better job in reconstruction? Well, okay, to, there's you know there's, sell it yeah, socially there's, somehow. There's several versions of reconstruction. Then let's look at Lincoln's version. So we've looked at the Republican plan and Andrew Johnson's plan. We didn't spend a lot of time on that, but Lincoln's plan was that you had te you had to have ten percent of any per any Southern state, any rebel state. Uh, uh, pledging allegiance to uh, to the Constitution of the United States, the Union, and then uh, office holders and officers would be uh, they could not vote and they could not hold office uh, from the Confederacy. They could not mm. do either of for those life. Things. That's right. They would be banned for life from that. But ten percent, the ten percent plan was a very uh, lenient Reconstruction. Lincoln wanted to re knit the Union as quickly as possible. Um, he saw the devastation of the war and wanted to reunify the country uh, as quickly as possible. But that did not prevail. Well, Lincoln was assassinated, and then Andrew Johnson's Reconstruction Plan involved requiring uh, planters, the wealthy planters, to apply to him in person for a pardon. He pardoned all of them. And so the Republicans in Congress came to hate Andrew Johnson. And, uh, and uh, then they went forward with their own reconstruction. Which is much tougher. That's where these constitutional amendments come into play. It's tougher. I would say it's, it's a, it is Lincoln's new birth of freedom. The constitutional amendments are so important. The ending he, he of slavery. He wanted those amendments. Yeah, well, Lincoln was on board. Yeah, Lincoln actually helped to, he was still alive when the uh, ending of slavery happened in the Congress. Um, and, and then, of course, the 14th Amendment, that's our that's our civil rights amendment. That's the amendment we use today to right. protect due process pr for all Americans yeah. to protect civil rights. Yeah. And the Fifteenth Amendment was simply banning the uh, stopping the banning of voting, except on the basis of uh, whether or not you've uh, uh, you've committed a crime, which was apparently happening it's, in the South. Well, um, actually, what happens in the South then is that uh, immediately after this amendment is passed, then uh, uh, then southern states define a crime as just being on the street. You don't have a job and you've committed a crime, and so they can throw African Americans back into slavery, into forms of slavery with that. So, yeah. Twisted. Yeah, so, so, so it, it, the, the Republican um, constitutional amendments, that was liberation. I don't think there's any other way to define that. Was it too onerous on the South to be liberated in this way? Um, well, I suppose history tells us that it, that it was uh, too much for the South to take, and this is why the Ku Klux Klan arises. Was, was, was the, the American military, the, the northern military yeah. that came, the Republican military, yeah. came down there to enforce these new amendments? Was there violence? Were there incidents? There was violence uh, between white supremacists and, and mostly between white supremacists and African Americans who were, you know, new voters and new office holders and... Yeah, there were there were a few pitched battles uh, over whether or not a state could uh, come back in under uh, uh, one of these new emancipationist constitutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, quite a bit of violence. Okay, and and so now you, you have the, the the North dominating on these points. They have the military there, right? And then these veterans from the Civil War, the, the Confederate side are putting on white outfits and, yeah. and riding and it, all across the South. And right? it's not just veterans, it's, it's sympathizers. It's white supremacists who yeah. sympathize with yeah. the cause of the Ku Klux Klan. But the Klan is put down in the 1870s. The Klan disappears by the 1880s. Because? Well, in part it's because the military in the South is given power to actually put down the Klan and to arrest Klan members. But the other part of it is they kind of achieved their goals. By 1877, then, the, the Congress uh, uh, passes a law, and the president signs it, which says that there's home rule. Home rule said that, said that the South can make its own laws without federal interference. Oh, wow, this changes things. And this allows uh, uh, segregation and disenfranchisement, segregationist laws to come into place, uh, disenfranchisement laws and, and uh, segregation laws, you know, laws that are separation and laws that disenfranchise not only African Americans, but poor whites as well. Mm. So, so, that's, so the Ku Klux Klan kind of achieved its goal. Uh, the Klan does not emerge again until uh, World War I. So let's hold it there. Okay. We'll take a short break. John okay. David Ann, history professor at <laughs> HPU. 
we'll come back and see the reemergence of yeah. the Klan, yeah. and we'll connect the dots from after World War I till now, right. when it's obvious they are still in existence, and in fact, some say they're growing. Oh, my God. We'll be right back. Aloha, welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investings, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you Tuesday. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, we're back. We're live here on Trump Week, and we're talking about hate in America. We're talking about white supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, and uh, with John Davidson, David, David Ann, who is um, telling us uh, about the, the Klan, perhaps as a metric, a canary in the coal mine, if you will, um, to help us understand yeah, white supremacy. Right. Yeah, that, that might be a good way of describing it, because, of course, the Klan, as I said, is very small today. But other groups and sympathy towards uh, white supremacy in general, that it might be growing. We really, it's hard to know how uh, you know, prominent it is, but it clearly has captivated some small part of the American public. So you mentioned before the break that uh, after World War I, um, it, it uh, reemerged. Right. And I guess that's both. Both, both of those things reemerged. That's correct. The so, Klan and, so the, and white supremacy. Really, the late 19th century is the heyday of of segregation and disenfranchisement. It's, it's also the heyday of racialist ideologies in which uh, pseudoscientists study African Americans and whites and, and conclude, of course, that African Americans are inferior to whites and never could reach up to the level of whites. This is very prominent in the late 1900s. Uh, uh, almost as a science already, it, social yes, science. You no, know, actually, these, you know, some of them who are, in fact, Southern planters. Uh, describe themselves as scientists and proclaim their work as scientific. And so, there's a connection there between the racist thing about the blacks, um, but also the immigrants coming from Europe in that same that, period. That's correct. So, so fr from the 1890s onward, then you have this huge, this massive influx of immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe in the range of uh, 30 million over several decades. And there's a reaction against this influx, and you have the Ku Klux Klan arising once again in 1915 in southern Indiana. And uh, this Klan now not only hates blacks, they, they hate Catholics, they hate Jews, they hate immigrants of any kind. What about Asians on the West Coast? Oh, yeah, yeah, but there's a, that's kind of it's a whole, distant. It's, it's distant. Well, it's a different anti-movement. Mm. Yeah, so enter Woodrow Wilson. Right, right. Oh, this is so interesting. Your yeah. head will spin hearing <laughs> about Woodrow you can bring Wilson. bring Wilson's picture let's, up. Let's see. Him. Yeah, there's right. Woodrow Wilson. Right, so Wood, Woodrow Wilson, of course, became president of the United States in 1913 and, and uh, uh, became kind of set a template in place of defining American internationalism for the entire 20th century, really, uh, became a, one of the most powerful people in the history of the world. But Wilson was also a white supremacist. Uh, he believed in segregation. He was the first president to segregate the White House. Uh, African-American maids and servants would have to now sleep in separate quarters and from whites. it had whites. not been segregated before Wilson. It had not Wilson. been segregated before Wilson. So, uh, and also, Wilson wrote a book right before he became president called uh, Disunion and Reunion. And in this book, uh, he talks about Reconstruction and talks about the effects of Reconstruction. And, and the book becomes an inspiration for another book, by a guy named Thomas Dixon called Birth of a Nation or the Klansman. It's about the Ku Klux Klan. And this was turned into a movie in 1915. Famous movie. That's right, uh, or infamous maybe. Thank you. Uh, called Birth of a Nation, 
which was shown around the country, and in fact, uh, Wilson had a special showing at the White House, and the, the movie quotes Woodrow Wilson. So if we could bring up that quote. That quote. I'm going to read this quote because it's very important to understand when, when I say that Wilson was a white supremacist and supported the Klan, he said it himself. The white men were roused by, and this is, this is during Reconstruction, uh, the white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the southern country, unquote. Scary, chilling. It, it is he was chilling. a southerner. He, he, Wilson was a southerner. He was from Virginia, uh, and he sided with white supremacists on this issue, um, and he believed that the Ku Klux Klan was a liberating force, yeah. that it had, in fact, liberated the South from this, uh, from this military occupation and the oppression of these constitutional amendments. What's odd about it is that he's the father of the League of Nations, he was trying to knit the world together after World War I? It's, it's a glaring contradiction in, in Wilson's thinking. But the, but the issue is that Wilson was dipping into this white supremacist narrative about Reconstruction, and then this narrative goes forward into the 20th century. It's not until, actually, W.E.B. Du Bois in 1935 publishes a book about Reconstruction in which he really deconstructs this white supremacist narrative. But it's really not until the 1950s and 60s that other historians jump on this and begin to do studies of the oppression during the Jim Crow days and of the liberation of uh, Reconstruction after the Civil War. So it takes a very long time and that narrative is not dead. What we're seeing today is that narrative of white supremacy still still populating, still drawing people, white supremacists to it, people with resentments against African Americans or other races, uh, people with a political agenda. Uh, so, so using that narrative, which has been kind of pumping just quietly underground here for several decades, actually probably since the Civil Rights Movement, when it kind of flared up again. So I would say this is another flare in that narrative, mm -hmm. that ideology of white supremacy. So. Um, I think that helps to explain, in historical terms, what we're looking at today. Well, I mean, I think a lot of uh, white, white uh, people in the South were disadvantaged during the Depression. Yeah. They didn't have prospects. They had to be mad at somebody. They were in competition with the blacks for jobs, and it fed the racism there. Yeah. And the racism never disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, I'm interested in you know, this, this reemergence, if you will, yeah. or the reattention to the issue in 1950s and 60s. Yeah. I guess. You know, what, what was happening there? I mean, we had uh, Brown versus Board of Education right. come in there. We had a, a new national awareness, and it was an awareness that said, let's not be racist. That's true. And yet, this was emerging again. That's right. Well, so, so um, I mean, this is, this is really quite interesting, because the Brown versus, versus Board of Education decision, uh, the, the justices actually have read a book called <laughs> An American Dilemma. And it's a, it's a book that's a study of racism in the South. Uh, and uh, this, this economist goes into the South and he writes, this, he writes up this study. He's not an American, by the way. He's, I think he's from Sweden. And, uh, uh, and, and he does this study and it becomes this big kind of book in the United States. And Supreme Court justices actually reference that book in their decision. Ah, interesting. Uh, saying that, that even if separate was actually equal, there is a moral high ground, which has to be recognized, that cannot condone any sort of separation of the races, because it implies and it indicates uh, the, the inferiority of one race to another. So, yeah. so that's why Brown versus Board of Education is such a powerful decision, because it has a moral imprimatur. A great moral statement. Yeah. Yeah. But, but could we just say, I mean, it's, it's hard to make judgments, value judgments now, but uh, it, did it work? Did it work? Well, um, there's a lot of debate about that, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the integration of schools. Mm. Okay. That's for another show, Jay. Yes. <laughs> Many shows there's to come lot, here. Again, you know, this probably hasn't worked like, uh, uh, like, like some people thought. thought. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. 
Um, so, so okay, yeah. so uh, 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 Bramber's Board of Education, and right. there's a struggle through the 60s. Right, right. And uh, you mentioned before the show, you know, in the Civil Rights Act days, uh, there was but, a lot of resistance and, 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 yeah. and feedback. Uh, but so in, back on in the 1960s, you had two presidents who embraced the Civil Rights Movement. And this is quite important because the Civil Rights Movement is winning some local uh, judicial victories victories in court cases. They're, they are winning those, and they're winning a few s state decisions. But it's really, they can't make much progress without the federal government getting involved. Right. And once uh, Eisenhower uh, sends troops into the South in 1957 to protect uh, students going to Little Rock High School. George Wallace, was it? The, no, this is uh, uh, Falbus. Oh, Falbus, Falbus, yeah, Falbus, yeah. yeah. Orville Falbus, who's yeah. the Famous, governor. infamous person. Yeah, that's right, governor of, of Arkansas, Arkansas and a white supremacist. Um, so, so that makes a difference. And then you have uh, John F. Kennedy, who supports the civil rights movement increasingly, because he recognizes in it, I think, as, as it goes forward, he recognizes a moral imperative. Yeah. And he doesn't at first. He sees it in terms of politics at yeah. first. But by 1963, he recognizes that there, this country really has a problem. Did he believe it or I just think, recognize it? Uh, no, I it? think he did by yeah. 1963. And then, of course, Kennedy is assassinated and John, Lyndon Baines Johnson becomes president. Johnson, has a con Johnson is actually grows up as a white supremacist. Uh. And Johnson actually has a conversion to the civil rights. Uh. Uh, and maybe that makes him the strongest advocate of civil rights because he becomes a, an incredibly strong advocate of civil rights. So, so we had those two presidents who led the federal presence, protecting those marchers in the South, prosecuting white supremacists in the South on, on federal charges when, when counties and states refused to do prosecutions because you had so many white supremacists in the South, or so many who, if they weren't white supremacists, they at least supported the system of segregation and so, so, and the civil rights movement is about destroying segregation and disenfranchisement. So, so you have presidents who support this. You see my point here. You have leadership at the top that helps make the right. civil rights movement possible. They get the Department of Justice to enforce those laws through the South under, under the federal power. In a different situation with a different president, yes. the civil rights movement might have failed. Yes. And I think that's a very important to think about point to think about today. right now. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So. so, what happened between, say, uh, 1968 and uh, Johnson's Civil Rights uh, Act? Right. And now, uh, right. where were we when Trump, uh, you know, just emerged? Right. So, well, you know, the the white supremacist movement never disappeared. The Ku Klux Klan never disappeared completely, although prosecutions against it uh, really ratcheted up in the 1960s. Uh, but it's very small. It's a discredited organization for the most part. Um, and civil rights became a call to enfranchise all kinds of different people. Uh, people with disabilities, gays and lesbians, right. uh, you know, people of different sexual orientations. Right. So, so it became this, what I would call an era of rights consciousness. And it's this, this idea, this cultural idea that, that everybody has a right, everybody has civil rights. Uh, that that uh, Trump has used effective used effectively in the 2016 campaign to say that hey this is political correctness and we don't need to this is just nonsense and you know we want we want ourselves to be recognized and so it's it's like an inversion of this rights consciousness yes. Trump is actually using this using yes. rights con rights consciousness to say hey white people have rights too so it's this kind of weird distortion of what was, you know, uh, what has been a, a very strong move by the country towards freedom and liberation, which is kind of at the basis uh, sort of, of social our, equality, social justice. That's correct. And all of a sudden it seemed to stop its tracks. And he was early on, you know, yeah. stroking the white supremacists, yeah. right? Yeah. And now it's come, it's come well, out in the open. He's, he's, he's come out. Right. So, so we don't live in 1877. We don't live in 1915. We don't live in 1963 either. We live in 2016, and a lot of attitudes have changed. And uh, so Trump's uh, clear sympathy for, you know, there are fine people in the Ku Klux Klan, clear sympathy f towards uh, white supremacists is, is out of sync. It's out of sync with the vast majority of the American people. Even 
even people who, according to the polling, said that what Trump said was okay, they probably were thinking more about what he said on Monday in right. his White House press conference right. when he read from a teleprompter, right. I condemn white supremacy. It gets confused, doesn't That's it? right, that's right. They probably are thinking more about that than they are about, uh, about what he said on Tuesday, which is, you know, and, and afterwards. So, so um, what's happened with him is that smaller, he's shaving off his base every time, it seems, every time he tweets or opens his mouth. He's offending more and more people. The, the, you know, the Republic, so he offended uh, uh, financial Republicans, business leaders, who are they're staunch Republicans. They would never consider but, voting Democrat, but they left his manufacturing and his other policy councils in droves. Uh, they decided themselves to shut it down. He later on tried to claim credit for that, but the truth is, in a concerted effort, they said, you know what, this is wrong, and we're, we're out of here. We're yeah. not supporting this guy. Yeah. Well, I think that's great, and that, that's a residual of the, you know, the Enlightenment, if you will, that followed the Civil Rights Act of, in the 60s. But, you know, one thing, and we need to discuss this going yeah. forward, yeah. is uh, what did he do in, in terms of the white supremacist group? Because he seems to have galvanized them. Yeah. They're coming out, they're speaking right. of uh, coming together, becoming right. stronger, and more violent. They'll yeah. tell you that. And, uh, you know, this could have a huge effect on the country. It only takes a few violent people right. to turn history around. Right. So that, that's an important point, a few. Because this is a very small group. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small movement. And uh, they might have people, other people in the background who are sympathetic, who are willing to use racial epithets, but are not willing to march. So this is a very small group. And... Uh, you know, will they turn violent? Uh, you know, the, the good news is the attorney general has said, hey, what happened in Charlottesville is a hate crime. That ups and the ante going to for the guy. It. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. So that ups the ante, ante for convicting this guy and, and punishing him much more severely. So, so I think, I mean, uh, let's, let's hope that there's not more violence. Let's hope. But we yeah. need to follow it, John. We yeah. need to see where it goes yeah. from here because... One thing is we are, we are on a historical transformation yes. of some kind, yes. Yes. and we always need a historian to help no, us understand right. it and that's get right. through it. Yes. Thank you, John David. You bet. You're welcome. Hawaii Pacific University, <laughs> professor of <laughs> history. Good to be here. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs>